Hi everyone and welcome to my channel where I talk about movies and today I'd like to start another uh, uh, three film uh, directors miniseries uh, covering uh, three movies from William Wyler. These will include the detective story or detective story with a powerhouse performance by Kirk Douglas. I believe this is 1951 and I think this is 55. This is The Desperate Hours with Humphrey Bogart. This is a recent Arrow release I would say that's a powerhouse cover. I just absolutely adore this cover. But I'm starting off with 1949's The Heiress. 1949, the year of my birth, the year that uh, The Third Man was released. And, and through much of my life, if somebody asked me my favorite film, I, was, I would more often than not probably say The Third Man. But I liked The Heiress, too. I always liked it from the first time I saw it on television. Um, it stars Olivia de Havilland, who's on the cover here, Ralph Richardson, and Montgomery Clift. But first, of it, before we get into the heiress, I, I just want to give a brief introduction to uh, William Wyler. For those not acquainted with him, he was a director who went back into the late silent film era, came into prominence in the uh, pre-code era uh, throughout his very long career, which extended to 1970, The Liberation of L.B. Jones. His last film, uh, he received 12 Academy Award nominations for Best Director. Still a record, I believe, and I don't think it's ever going to be broken because in the studio era, directors like Wilder were making uh, one and sometimes even two films a year. So he is, uh, he is known for his intimate dramas, uh, often centering on family conflicts, conflicts between the generations. Um, known for his deep focus uh, movies. Uh, often he, he, he uh, worked with uh, Greg Tolan, who was one of the masters of deep focus photography, known for his dramaturgy. In other words, he, would, he could get uh, very precise uh, and sometimes subtle performances out of actors, and he had a very fluid camera style that uh, enhanced uh, performance. He was really an actor's uh, director, well, actors always wanted to work with him. He was he was very much a perfectionist, and he would often do a great many takes that would sometimes uh, uh, infuriate his actors. But uh, they were always they were always happy with the result that came out of it. Um, so uh, the conflict here is between characters, and uh, in fact, in the uh, essay that's included, this is a Criterion release, November sale coming up in a couple of weeks, hopefully. Uh, Pamela Hutchinson has an essay here in which she quotes Wilder as saying that he creates gun battles between characters. Now he's saying this at a time when westerns were highly popular and gun battles, but these are gun battles of words and of, uh, of emotion and um, in his films. And uh, I was, uh, earlier this year I saw Counselor of the Law. This is one of his Wilder's pre-code movies with John Barrymore, probably his best performance in the sound era. And again, this was very early Wilder and I was just stunned by how well he was able to uh, tell this story in minimal amount of sets. This was based on a uh, stage play and Wilder made uh, 12 movies based on stage plays. And he was always able to, to make them on stagey. <laughs> so even the heiress, which is basically a drawing room drama, um, is really, visually, it's very exciting. <laughs> um, so uh, again, I saw Counselor of Law very impressed. And I said, well, I gotta start you know, revi revisiting some of uh, Wilder's other films and looking over his filmography, which is, really is impressive. Uh, the counselor at law later on in the 30s, The Good Fairy. Mike over at DAG Films has recently released a video on The Good Fairy, and I'll link uh, in the description box below uh, to that video. Uh, the Letter in 1940 with Betty Davis. I, you know, my favorite Betty Davis performance, it's, it's, it's one of my favorite films. It's just beautiful. Anybody who's seen the film, that opening shot where the camera uh, moves, tracks through the jungle and comes to a house and Betty Davis comes out and is plugging bullets into a man. <laughs> and, and, but the, every performance there, and Betty Davis is kind of restrained in this film, 
uh, but every performance is is really good and and Weiler was very much associated with Betty Davis and made several films with her in, including in the 1940s the little foxes uh, <clears throat> but let's come back to the heiress now this is based on a stage play uh, that was adopted from Henry James's novel uh, Washington Square. If you've never read Henry James, Washington Square or Daisy Miller uh, would be my recommendation as, as entry points into it. They're, they're short, and, uh, but you get the taste of what uh, Henry James does, and his films very often are domestic dramas, so uh, Weiler would be a, uh, an, an excellent uh, interpreter of, of James's uh, kind of a, a, a emotional repression. James's films were very much about psychological realism and, and Weiler is, is, is certainly, that's, the, that's some of the meat of the matter in, in, in William Weiler's uh, films. Uh, so this is a story, 1850, Washington Square, New York City. And it is a battle, a battle of wills between a father and a daughter. Dr. Sloper, played by Ralph Richardson, is a rich society doctor. Um, and he has lost his wife many years before, but he has a daughter. Now, the problem here is that Dr. Sloper uh, idealizes the memory of his wife. She was the most clever person, the most uh, sophisticated, the most beautiful person. Um, she was, conversation was, was, was uh, uh, memorable, and uh, everything about her was great. He no longer has his wife, but he does. His wife has given him a daughter. Unfortunately, this daughter is exactly the opposite of what his wife was in Dr. Sloper's idealized memory. So uh, she is plain, she is dull, she does not have the social graces. She, she's uh, evidently in her 20s. She's not getting any suitors. Uh, men seem to shy away from her. But she's rich. Uh, the father has 20,000 a year. The daughter has 10,000 a year through her mother's wealth. Uh, doesn't sound like much today, but in 1850, that was a considerable fortune. So she, does, she goes to a party, and uh, all of a sudden, she does indeed have a suitor in the, in the, in the person of Morris Townsend. Morris Townsend played by um, Montgomery Clift. And, uh, and he, is a, he is almost penniless. He has squandered his, uh, his, uh, uh, what inheritance he got from his family by traveling through Europe, uh, living in Paris. He's, he's used it pretty much all up, so he's back home. He has no job, uh, but he is charming, and he is incredibly good looking. He is intelligent, and he has set his eye on Catherine, who falls immediately in love with her. Dr. Sloper sees him immediately as a fortune hunter, that there's no way in the world that man could be in love with his daughter. It's only the 30,000 a year. <laughs> that's, what he's, that's what he's courting. Um, now, and that, that sets up this battle, this gun battle of wills between father and daughter. Daughter may not be what the memory of Dr. Sloper's wife is, she's not that, <laughs> but she is like Dr. Sloper. She has an iron will. So this is, this is a genuine battle, and the two actors are just amazing. The scenes between Ralph Richardson and Olivia de Havilland here are just uh, William Wyler and those two actors at their best. So as I said, it was based on a stage play by uh, Ruth and August Getz. Olivia de Havilland had seen it on Broadway. She was, I have to play that part. She contacted William Wyler, you gotta buy this. I wanna play this part. And Wyler went to New York, saw the play, and immediately got the studio to buy it. Um, he, um, and then, so we had Olivia de Havilland uh, uh, for the, for, to play Catherine. And on Broadway, uh, Catherine was played by Wendy Hiller, and uh, the doctor was played by Vassal Rathbone, who really wanted to play this part, but he was too associated with um, Sherlock Holmes by then, but he was a great stage actor by all accounts. So uh, Wilder was able to persuade Ralph Richardson to come to New York, to come to Hollywood. He was acting on stage. Richardson did not make many 
many movies. Uh, he, he loved the stage. Uh, but he, and he's reputed to be one of the greatest actors. There are many people who think of the big three actors, English actors of his era, which included Gilgood and uh, Laurence Olivier, that Richardson was the best. And whatever film I've ever seen him in, he is just absolutely astonishing, as he is here as Dr. Sloper. Um, so, and then they got Mon Montgomery Clift, 29 years old. He was uh, on the cusp of, of genuine stardom. He was matinee idol looks. If ever, anybody could uh, personify uh, Morris Townsend, it would be Montgomery Clift. He has charm, he has charisma, he has really good looks. So the, the film, as I said, was based on a novel by Henry James, and it, um, uh, uh, a short, fairly, fairly short novel, which I reread recently, and a good starting point if you've never read Henry James. Um, but uh, and the Getzes stick to the uh, the novel fairly well. I don't know about the stage play, but as far as the movie goes, um, they uh, they do change a, a couple elements in the in the play, uh, especially uh, the two. Uh, climactic scenes in the movie uh, are very much more melodrama than they are in the book. And the Getz has also compressed the time period, whereas in the novel this goes on for quite a, uh, uh, many, many years. So th this is compressed down. But much of the dialogue is Henry James's dialogue. Even in the, in the ending that's, that's so much changed, it nevertheless has the same thrust to it uh, with, with the same dialogue. So as far as the performances go, Olivia de Havilland wins the Academy Award. Um, uh, she is, uh, is thought to be her best performance. Um, now I thought that, uh, I've always thought the one weakness for me in her performance is that her awkwardness in the first half of the film is, is, is kind of exaggerated. You know, they, they really make the point that this is an awkward woman, but there's no doubt in the final, in the final third of the film, she has scenes that are just absolutely powerful, uh, and Ralph Richardson, as I said, just extraordinary actor. Montgomery Clift. Uh, now there is uh, there is a story uh, that Olivia Davin tells that uh, Montgomery Clift uh, didn't like her and didn't think she, didn't think much of an a, that she was much of an actress, but when they arrived on the set. Uh, they, uh, they, were, uh, they actually had sort of a strange kind of rehearsal period. Uh, Cliff had, a rot, had come with, he already knew how he was going to play this role of Morris Townsend. So, and Olivia de Havilland was, was shocked by that because she was eager to see well, how William Wyler wanted her to play the part. Montgomery Cliff, a method actor. Uh, he had a coach on, on set that he, had, that he consulted. And Olivia Davlin says there were times, uh, quite a few times when they were when they were shooting the scenes, that she felt like Montgomery Cliff was 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 acting with her. He was just into his character, and his conception of that character. A little bit of that does come come through in uh, in in the movie, um, but nevertheless, uh, both of them have have magnificent scenes, and. And as often in William Wyler, every, every uh, supporting player, no matter how low, has sort of a vivid moment. And, but it, the, actually, the fourth biggest role in the film is played, which is the aunt, uh, Dr. Sloper's sister, uh, uh, Catherine's aunt, uh, is living with them, played by Miriam Hopkins. Uh, and she is, uh, she is more, she's even deeper in love <laughs> with Morris Townsend than... Uh, than Catherine is, and she kind of sets the ball rolling for this romance. And she wants; she's a widow. She wants to vicariously experience this this love affair with uh, uh, with Morris Townsend. Uh, I have to mention Mona Freeman as the as Dr. Slober's other sister, who is very commonsensical and sees uh, a Ka a Catherine much different than her father does, and, and keeps telling him, "You're underestimating your daughter." Betty Lindley plays Morris's uh, uh, sister, and Dr. Sloper goes to interview her, trying to get her to say bad things, that he is indeed a fortune hunter. Dr. Sloper is convinced 
that uh, Morris is a fortune hunter, is only interested <clears throat> in her money, and uh, and he'll disinherit. You still have ten thousand, but ten thousand isn't thirty thousand. Uh, there, the the the, um, the maid is played by Vanessa Brown, and very small performance, but very vivid, very vivid moments. She's very attractive, and I looked up her filmography, but there wasn't much. Uh, after um, after the heiress, so uh, eight nominations for Academy Awards for its year. I think it got the most nominations of any other film. Won four wins, didn't win Best Picture, but it did win Louis de Havilland her Academy Award. Uh, it also won for um, uh, for uh, production design, for score, uh, and for costume. Uh, great reviews, did good business. <clears throat> it's definitely. Um, again, as I, I said earlier, in, in the next Criterion uh, uh, Flash or uh, Barnes Noble sale, this is this is one I would recommend. Okay, thanks a lot for everybody who managed to listen. I do appreciate it. Comments are welcome. Take care.